Once again, welcome everybody. Um, it's our second Sunday where we're able to worship the way worship should be had. Um, it's encouraging to be next to and sitting next to one another. It's encouraging seeing one another. It's encouraging hearing one another. I think you get the drift. It's encouraging just to be together. And indeed, um, stating the obvious, it's been very, very challenging the past couple of years with lockdowns, uh, social distancing, isolation, and all the other challenges that we've spoken so many times in the past. But it seems to me that those challenges continue. I mean, I've always maintained that pandemic, the way we've experienced it in the past couple of years, is nothing more than just another challenge that humanity goes through, just through all the other challenges that we read in history, except for this one, we're actually living it ourselves. And it is slightly different from the rest of it, but a challenge nevertheless. Um, and especially for Christians, because any challenges that we face in life, whether it be the pandemic or whether it be something personal at home, uh, whether it be at, at work, um, life is life. Um, it is challenging to our faith because as a Christian, what defines us as a Christian is the way we live out our Christianity. And you can't do that in isolation. Sure, you can pick up the phone and that's just about it. You can jump on Zoom and that's just about it. But what defines my Christianity is the way we live our Christianity. And um, up until when we had, you know, before the, uh, the, uh, the pandemic, there was a routine. And routine is a good thing. Consistency is a good thing. Um, the sociologists and psychologists often talk about being consistent, being, being um, uh, routine is good. It just you know, sets boundaries and it keeps you grounded. And that's a good thing. As long as it doesn't just become a routine, because we can fall into the trap of just becoming a routine. And it's, a, it's amazing how pandemic come, comes about and all of a sudden throws a routine out the window. Then you start to reassess. And I'm sure I know I have, and a lot of other people have, you start to question about my Christianity and my faith. Uh, I'm, I'm challenged now in a different way. How do I live that out now? How do I act as a Christian? Where does my faith stand? My faith stand? And where is God in all of this? And, um, and things have been disrupted now. It has been disrupted, and it still is. And what's how things are going to be post-pandemic. You know, you during the pandemic and the way we interacted with one another over the phone and over Zoom and, and, and share things and wherever possible, try to catch up with one another here and there. Uh, there was always talk in looking forward to post-pandemic, but I'm not quite sure what that is going to be, what that norm is going to be. Will it ever be the same as pre-pandemic? I don't know. There was a hope and a romantic notion that we will go back to the way it was, but maybe it won't. Maybe there lays a challenge before us as a church, as Christians, as a community. I don't know. Um, it certainly is going to be a challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, we are grateful for technology. I mean, imagine if this was taking place where there was no technology and we'd be totally isolated and not be able to see each other at all. And uh, we've had Saturday night Zooms and uh, we, Philip's not here, but we thank Philip for the effort that he has done in, in keeping that running every Saturday night, in sharing that, and uh, which was great and just brought people together, albeit in a virtual way. And uh, obviously we have you know, uh, Sunday mornings YouTube, so we'll still be able to share the word over, over the internet and the people were able to log on. And, um, and um, I mean, we were not able to see you, but we always had you in our minds, I know I did, and, um, and I'm sure the others did as well. But simply that's not church. It served a purpose, it helped us through, but that's not church. This is church. You sitting next to one another, me seeing you and you seeing me, feeling one another. Um, that is church. 
supporting one another, being there. And it's not without its challenges. <laughs> we all know that there are challenges. But this is church. But one thing I have to say, um, and you sort of, when you've been around for a long time and you see the progression, um, in the past few years, and I'm talking about now pre-pandemic, there was a bit of a trend that I noticed and maybe I'm wrong, but that's, this is my re reflection, that it, was, it became easier because of technology, it became easier to sort of, you know what, I don't feel like going today. I'll just stay home, get my iPad out, and log on to a sermon on YouTube. And I did notice that it just became easier. It, as good as technology can be, it can also be a detriment to our relationship to our personal relationship and within the community. And I have to admit, you know, the sermons out there, they're quite good. And they're much better than mine, that's for sure. They're very articulate, very structured. Um, there's a lot of great talent out there. But they lack one thing. They're disconnected from the listener. The sermons might be convicting, it might be encouraging, it might be inspiring, it might be fantastic, and you get what you get out of it. But then what? You and I can sit down, have a meal, have a discussion, have an argument. Yeah, we can disagree. We can touch each other. I mean, you know, <laughs> hug each other and things like that. We can hear each other. We can feel each other. They can't. So it's more than just the sermon. It's all about life and living the sermon rather than just, uh, uh, as I said, you, know, you, can, you can preach the best you know, sermon out, but if there's no life in it and if I don't live it, frankly, it's just, as um, Paul says, it's just words, just like getting the, uh, the symbols and you're banging, 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 and it makes no sense. You know, um, they cannot, when I say they, you know, when you log on, and, and as I said, there are some fantastic preachers out there, but they can't sit with you in the time of your need. You and I can. They cannot sit together and break bread that we are going to do soon after the service. Um, they cannot pick up the phone and say, hey, George, how are you going? Mate, I heard that, uh, you know, uh, you're not feeling well. Or, as it's happened to me, you know, I get some of the older people, Andrea, uh, Bospa, Sorry, uh, Andrew, how are you? Are you doing well? Uh, and not get taken back. I said, oh, but that's my response. I should be doing that. And here other people doing it to me, and I thought, hang on a minute, we all need that. It's, it's incumbent to all of us to do that, not just the leadership and things like that. I, I'm not into that. We're all here to serve one purpose, and that's God's purpose. And each one has his own um, abilities and talents and you use them for God's glory and for his people. That's how I say things, you know. Um, yeah. And it, it got to this day <laughs> and I'm laughing because I fell into the trap once um, after I, I did a sermon on YouTube and after a while you know, people, people were talking about hits and thumbs up and thumbs down. I thought, oh, I've never checked. Why did I do that? There was one thumb down. And I thought to myself, no, that's it, I'm quitting, I'm going, and that's enough to do myself. <laughs> Am I being judged now by how many hits I get? Or how many thumbs up or thumbs down? Does that determine who I am? I have no idea why people do that, and why, why should I judge anything according to you know, <laughs> the, the hits and whatever, because it seems to be that in social media, that's, that, that's what's important nowadays. How many likes do I get? That determines who I am. No. It's how I live my life. It's how I interact with you and how you interact with me. That's what counts. That's what God's going to judge. Not, it's not going to go, you know, um, say, oh, Andrew, yeah, I see, yeah, yeah, not many hits, mate. I'm sorry, mate. You, you, you don't cut the mustard, you know. If you can have the first Annie, first verse, thank you. Therefore, as the elect of God, 
And I hope you've got the right one there, Amy. No? Colossians chapter 3. I'm just quoting here, Paul, from Colossians. And he says, Therefore, as the elect of God, um, that is, those who have answered to God's calling, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and I'm not sure how you would do that over the internet, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, I mean, I can't even go to talk to the person to put the thumb down to say, Mason, what's, can we sit down and talk about this? Is there something I've done wrong? I can't even do it because I don't even know who they are. But here it says that if anyone has a complaint against one another, even as God... Christ forgave you, you also must do. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you will call in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell within you richly in all wisdom. Paul here is addressing a church, and he's talking to each and every one individually richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, just exactly what we did just before we started the service, just before I started talking, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And it was lovely to hear, I mean, Phil's voice is not too bad, but it's nice to hear everybody else's voice rather than, you know, because Zoom is very, very limited. Um, with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And as I said, you can't do that on your own at home. And let's face it, when you were listening on a Saturday night of you logged on fellowship, how much singing did you really do? I mean, I, because I was there with my wife and, and her voice is okay, but mine's absolutely terrible. I, I, I felt very uncomfortable. It just wasn't right. But here with you, and I've always said it, I might have a bad voice, but when I'm singing with you, see my voice sounds a lot better? It does. I can sing in three different keys at the same time. So that's how good I am. But you can't do that on your own. You should go crawl. Cold. And I brought this example before because I'd like and I'll bring it again. There was once a... Um, a brother in a church um, in Europe somewhere and he was disgruntled and uh, he decided that he was going to stop going to church. So for a long while he stopped going and one of the pastors said no, that he wasn't coming so he decided to go and uh, visit him. And it was in the middle of winter, it was cold and uh, he knocked on the door and opened it up. They sort of looked at each other and just come in. So he went in and uh, the fire was going because as I said it was in the middle of winter. So they sat down in front of the fire but not a word was spoken. After a while, the pastor that went to visit him, as the fire was burning, uh, back in those days there was with wood, he took a log out that was burning and pulled it out of the fire and just left it on the side there and started to smolder. The fire went out. And when the fire went out, he actually got up and left. And as he was leaving, the guy said to him, thank you for that fiery sermon. He didn't say anything. But just by that one example, it spoke to him. And he realised that being in isolation, being away, for whatever reason, it's not healthy for our spiritual lives. It's not even healthy for our normal lives. Sociologists talk a lot about connectivity between human beings. We need that. That's how God created us. Um, it's very beneficial, and uh, as I said, a lot of socio sociologists will say that, that despite the challenges that we have, I was talking to my physiotherapist the other day, and he's of Anglo-Saxon uh, background, and he's a Christian, and, um, and he's also a relative, when I say a relative, he's my son-in-law's brother. And we're talking about our youngest grandchild now and, um, you know, how wonderful it is. And we're talking about how it takes a village. And we've often said this, it takes a village to raise a child. And I said to him, yeah, as long as it's not a Greek village. And he started laughing because, you know, we Greeks are, are what we are. We know how to support. That's where the word in Greek, philoxenos, comes from. Loving the, um, the, uh, the xenos, loving the... Um, 
The foreigner, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, we do that quite well. But we also get meddling in other people's business as well. We do that quite well as well. But they are the challenges. They, I mean, you know, this is what it means being part of a community. We know each other quite well. There's great support there. Hey, yeah, there's, there's other things too. There's support. And I know that even, even listening to, to, to some of the testimonies that we heard over Zoom, that, uh, and especially one that John you know, had the support that he, because I know the people and, and I know the story that, and I felt it as well, the support that you got when you first came to church, everybody just gathered around you. Not just to find out about what's going on in, in your life, but to support you. And we felt that. But you can't do that at, at a distance. Um, and the sharing, we're sharing one another, with one another. You know, you have to think that the problems that you're going through are yours alone, but they're not. There's a lot of common uh, uh, you know, things that connect us as being human beings. Um, there's reinforcement. Sometimes you're feeling down and somebody comes along and says one word, says, it says a sentence or whatever, puts his hand around your shoulder. You can't do that at a distance and it reinforces your faith and your belief in God. And the world is not so bad after all. Um, it keeps us grounded, it keeps us assured. And as I said, with the advent of technology and mobile phones, we've lost the art of communicating with one another. Um, and it's a problem that even, as I said, sociologists have been talking about this for years now. Um, and, you know, um, the art of sharing, um, you know, we, we, we've become enclosed in our own cocoons, disconnected. And the pandemic has caused that even within churches and within our community as well. And this is something that we need to arrest uh, and to be mindful about. You know, sometimes, and I've experienced this, I might be with a friend and I says, hey mate, you know, I, I sense this, something's going wrong, are you okay? Try doing that over the internet. You can't, because you're not getting that vibe. You need to be in close proximity to be able to pick up those vibes. How are you going? Is everything okay? I sense there's something going on. Do you want to share it? I'm here for you. The lack of interaction causes another problem. And again, let's think of this in, in, in our spiritual lives. Um, it diminishes our responsibility. If I don't have to put up with you, I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not responsible. I just stay in my own little world, used in your own little world, and yeah, good luck with that. We need to, as we said before, as, and, and, and Paul was saying, we need to be accountable to one another. It's the only way that we can encourage one another, and it's the only way that we can stand in faith with a purpose to serve the one that's actually died for us on the, sin, uh, on the cross because of our sin. He didn't do it remotely. He did it among us. He came down. Emmanuel, we're going to hear that word a bit more often as we get close to Christmas. God is with us. He, he's dwelling with us. He came with us. He's not over there somewhere looking down on us. He is among us. If we felt that it was so important to be among us, how much more we should be feeling to be together with one another, despite all the challenges uh, that we face. And as I said, with, uh, uh, you know, they talk about social distancing. Well, now we are socialising at a distance. Yeah, how many times have you told your kids come to dinner and you ask them and they're only about 20 metres away? Come, dinner's ready. Really? <laughs> I've done it. My son's in the back room, he's gone now, but he's in the back room, Harris, uh, can you come over there? Dinner's ready now, mate. Yeah, I'm coming over there in five minutes. Oh, cool, yeah, emojis and whatever. <laughs> Anyway, it's quite funny, but uh, it's, it can be a little bit sad, though. Um, part of my spiritual growth is when my faith is challenged. And none bigger challenge is through relationships. When you're married, boy, you've got a challenge. You've got kids, boy, you've got a challenge. You've got parents, boy, you've got a challenge. You've got brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, there, there's a now, there's a challenge. But that's how 
I develop and grow in my spiritual life when I learn from God how to deal with one another. And we're all different. A faith is, is realised. It, it, it faith needs to be realised. You know, so, oh, you know, your property is worth how much? No, it's not. It's only worth whatever it is when I sell it. That's why it's called real estate, real. When you realise something, then you see the real worth. And God is all about relationships. We know that. You open up the Bible and it doesn't matter where you open it up, it's all about relationships. About God talking to man. About people, how they interact and the problems they have with one another and how they support one another. There's some wonderful stories there of great support and there's also some very sad stories of conflict. It's all about relationships. But as I said, it's not about, you know, doing a great sermon but it's more about living it. Jesus, he was the great preacher. He was the teacher. And yet what drew people to him often wasn't so much, not only what he, what he preached, of course, but often he was misunderstood or people just didn't get what he said. But it was the fact that he was willing to sit down with anybody, and especially for those who were in need. He interacted with them. And he showed compassion to them. And it's something that we need to, to aspire to do. And it's no coincidence that when you read the first line in, in, in the book of Acts, when Luke penned this, and he writes and he says, uh, The former account I made, O Theophilus, all of all that Jesus began to both do and teach. Now, my English is probably not the best. I did go to special English class when I went to high school, so I don't know whether that makes my English special or not. But I would have thought if I was writing that, you would have written it like this. Teach and do. Doesn't that make more sense? You guys are a bit more educated than me. You teach and then you do, right? But Luke says, and it's, I, I don't believe it's a coincidence that he, he, he swapped those words around. He did and he taught. Actions speak louder than words. And Jesus did that. And he came to serve us. He came to serve us. He preached to us. He showed compassion to us. He showed us the way. He served us even better by more more importantly, by dying on the cross through his resurrection, that we might become uh, beneficiaries of the kingdom of God. That's the hope that we're living in now, the one that we will be with him and enjoy his company and enjoy the company of all the other saints that have gone before us. That is the purpose. That is the end game, so to speak. So the question is, how then I can best serve him if not serving his people? That's what, that's what this relationship is all about. And that's what, the, especially the New Testament, is all about. God came, sent his son to earth to die on the cross for our sins. He paid for our sins. He opened up the doors to heaven. We are now beneficiaries of that. Now what? How then, as he served us, we serve him? And I can't remember when I, when I said this, and I asked the question, how do you love God? I mean, you love your husband and your wife by buying them flowers. I mean, you don't buy your husband flowers. But maybe you do, I don't know. But you buy your wife flowers. And you might cook a nice meal to your husband. That's how you show them the love. Or you might buy gifts for your kids or, or buy them things or whatever they want or you look after. But how do you love God? What do you buy him? The best way to love God is to love his people and to serve his people the way he served us. And Paul often, and we don't worry about the next one, Annie, um, because we're running out of time, but um, Paul often um, relates our relationship, our Christianity rather, as he says in um, Galatians that, I have been crucified with Christ. So in other words, it's not me now. I should not be living for myself. I should be living the life that Christ wants me to live. Because the words are, I've been crucified with Christ, it is 
no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. This is how you live, and this is how I live my Christianity, which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me on the cross. And Jesus gave us the example. You will remember, you will remember when, just before he was to suffer on the cross, the, at the uh, Last Supper. And uh, the Bible says, you, you, we read that in John 13. The Bible says that at, once they, they supped, he got up, you know the story quite well, and he puts a robe on, a servant robe, got a container of water, and proceeded to watch, wash each and every one of the disciples' feet, including those of the one who was going to betray him. He didn't make that distinction. He, he washed everybody's feet. And then you remember, because, oh, no, 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 you're gonna, not going to wash my feet. And I call that misplaced humility. Because Jesus said to me, if you don't allow me to do this to you, you're not part of what I'm all about. Because then if you don't learn that from me, you will not do that to others. Peter had to learn that lesson. And, um, and then he goes on to say, Annie, have we got the next one, please? I Give me an example. Um, no? Okay, it doesn't matter. He says to them, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So the instructions from our Lord is simple. Just do what he's, he's done. And Jesus is saying, saying listen, you know, I'm over and above everybody here, but I'm not. I'm here to serve. So if you and I can learn that lesson from our master, it will keep us in good, stead for, in good stead for his purpose. Now, we're going to get to our text. You thought I've forgotten. I haven't. Let us open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I tend to do things a little bit differently sometimes. Just to break the tradition and keep you on the ball. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse, we we'll take it from verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, and Paul writes here to the brethren, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's just pause it for a second. Previous to that, Paul has gone into explaining about the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. And in this particular case, he makes a distinction between the sacrifices that the Jews did in order to come closer to God, because the only way they can come close to God is go to the temple, present the sacrifices, the priest would do whatever he was doing, and that allowed the that was the way of a sinner or the Jew to come and have communion with God. Through but the, he, he needed a sacrifice. Okay? So and once he's done all that, Paul says, now that we have our, our conscience has been sprinkled, um, having, we have a true heart with assurance of faith. In 23 now it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So we have a confession of faith. We, our faith is not, it's not something you've got, you put it in your pocket and nobody can see it. You confess it by mouth, by action. It is something that it is seen and experienced by yourself and others around you. He who promises faith. Let us consider one another. This is the, what I said initially, the realisation of our restoration. You know, like that. It is, the transformation has happened now and this is being realised. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking, not forsaking, 
not forsaking of ourselves together, as is in the manner of some, or in other uh, um, Bibles it says not forsaking the, the gathering of the saints, not forsaking what we're doing here, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If there's one thing that pandemic has taught us is we are not in control of our destiny. We don't know what tomorrow is going to, going to bring. We've been talking about, and John spoke about this last night, and yeah, we, we've been talking about the end time and when's that going to be. And that we're talking about the end time since the Bible was written. Well, now two, over 2,000 years have gone by. Jim, I tell you what, we must be getting fairly close by when you look at the signs. Uh, I'm, I'm not into you know, predicting because I've no idea. All I do know that we are getting close. It could happen in my lifetime. It could very well happen that I have a car accident and I die before that. It, 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 the time is not mine. It's, it's extremely limited. That's why Paul says, now that you hear my words, do not harden your heart now, because tomorrow is not ours. We have no idea. But for the, for the time being, though, do not forsake the assembly. It is incumbent on each and every Christian to be here. Whether it be Peel Street, that doesn't worry me. Whether it be... I'm not going to name any other churches. That, that, that is not my concern. It doesn't really matter. As long as we are committed to the community that we are in, and I am a positive effect to that community, that is incumbent upon me. When I read this, it is talking to me. I'm not going to read this and sit back and say, well, you know, everybody should go to church and they should be there, and I'm home watching YouTube or whatever. You know, in the Greek, um, I, I use the word, well, you know, the English word says exhorting one another. In the Greek that most of our parents read, it says, protrepon, uh, protrepon, I, I, I encourage you. But in the original Greek, it's a lot harder word, paroxino. Now, xino means, I get you know, agitated, more or less. It's almost like, I need to be so, I've got, I've got to agitate you, if, I can, if, if that's the right way of saying it, to be here. I've got, I've got to almost become a pest. I mean, you probably tell me, get out of my face, go home and leave me alone. That's why we don't do it. But Paul felt it was so important that he used that word, baroxino, which goes beyond that just exhorting. Come along, you know, it'd be nice to be together. Yes, of course it is. But it's a, it, is, it is a responsibility that each and every one of us has. And I have to find a way to be here. There's many excuses I can use not to be here. But I have to find a way to be here. And there's, I know there's been a lot of discussion and I'm not going to get into it. Each and every one is, has a choice to do whatever they want. All I'm saying and all I'm expecting of myself is I need to be here. And not just here preaching, that's, that's just you know, part of what I do. But Paul says, because if I'm not here, I can't come up to you and say, John, how are you going, man? You know, you, 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 yeah, just, you know, I know you've got a problem. I know you're going through this, and, uh, you know, but God has promised us that he's always with us and so forth and so on, and an encouraging word, and you come up to me, you do the same. And we are on a journey, and we are, we're not... Uh, as I said some time ago, that even our, our lives run parallel, but we run together, though. Parallel means running on the same way, but not, we're not in each other's lanes. We've got, each one has his own lane, but we're running parallel to one another. And it's a comfort to each and every one of us to help get to the end. Where, you know, it's, yeah, it, the church is not made up of angels. Gee, that would be much easier. And it's not made up of borgs. Does anybody know what a borg is? Okay, so none of you watch Star Trek. You do? Oh, okay. The Borg was um, uh, uh, um, um, an alien race. Obviously, it's not true. It's not in the Bible. Um, and they were assimilated into a collective. 
assimilation into a collective. And they all had one mind, one thought, one action. There might have been millions of them, and they used to travel in this cube, and they were a formidable force in, in the universe because they acted as one, even though there was millions, and they were all interconnected. So you heard one, you heard the other who was in the other parallel universe. We're not Borgs, we're not clones of one another. Paul talks about unity, but not necessarily uniformity. That is never going to happen because each and every one of us are different. Different mindsets, different characters, different backgrounds, different social economic uh, uh, situations, um, education. Uh, we're all different, but the same at the same time. And this is where the challenge lies. This is where my faith in God that he puts up with me, I have to find a way for you to put up with me. I mean, with you, of course. But you're easier to put up with. I might not be. This is my faith being challenged. This is my faith being realised in a practical sense. You know, um, this is spirituality. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love especially when we're living in these perilous um, uh, times. Yes, and as Paul says, in each church, you have your babes. You have your carnal Christians. You've got your spiritual Christians. You can see how complex and conflicting that can be. And she's not surprised us. I mean, like I said, we walk off families and, um, and, and, and relationships, and we know the challenges. Church is no different. So I'm going to leave you with a question, um, but I'm not going to give you the answer. Something I'd like us to ponder. Have a chat with your wife, your husband, your kids. In addressing the issues that we may face, do you address the issue and then restore the relationship? Or do you work on the relationship to deal with the issue? I'll repeat that. Do you address the issue in order to restore the relationship, or do you work on the relationship in order to deal with the issue? God is a God of order, and we read that in the Bible. We see that in the universe. Everything that is created is in order, and the same thing is in his church. And we read that in Ephesians, and each one has his gift, and, and, um, and God wants order in his church. But because of our marred humanity, our sinful nature, um, often what comes naturally to us is ego and pride. What doesn't come natural is humility and to serve one another. And that's something that we have to learn and work on. This is why we repeat this and that's why Paul has written this uh, for posterity and for eternity for us to learn and to keep on working on it. And we have our failings, we, we fall, then we realise and we, we pick ourselves up and, and we apologise. This is part of conflict. And it's nothing new. You know, what not surprises me, but what um, encourages me is that God's word never shies away from problems and conflicts that existed even within spiritual people. Even the Apostle Paul, um, and I'll read something that, um, you know, that he wrote, and I wasn't sure whether I should read this or not because I thought, oh, yeah, it's a bit negative, but it's the truth. He goes, if possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Isn't Paul here putting some limitation on his responsibility? Because he's saying, if possible, it might not be possible. And Paul had such an experience with his best friend, Barnabas. They had a, that came to conflict and they split up. But we'll read later on that resolved the differences. But God's work did not cease to happen. Paul went off and did, he went on his missionary uh, uh, trips as did Barnabas with Marcus. I'm not going to judge uh, whatever. Uh, you know, we have to say, oh yeah, but Paul did more than Barnabas. No, no, God's going to judge that. But what, what is important is that these things will happen. And it's incumbent upon me to, to find a way to deal with it. And God even gives me the principles 
on how to do with it. It might not give me the, the practicalities, but we learn from that on how to do it. And a lot of it has to do with humility. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ had, had um, uh, shown to us. And yeah, when Paul says, I endeavor, in, in, when we read the verse in Hebrew, endeavoring, and in the Greek is and I thought, okay, yeah, you've got to learn this thing because it's not part of our nature, because of our sinful nature. It's not, you know, we have to learn these things. But it's more than just learning. It's actually, even if you go and look at the, at the, at the dictionary, endeavour means I'm serious. I'm actively, seriously about doing something about it. Okay? It's not just talk. It's actually very active in applying myself to do what God is telling me to do. I, I make it my aim. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of hard work. And as I said, you know, uh, these are the challenges, but this is how our, our, we, we grow spiritually. Um, so time is running away from us, so I will, I will stop here. So I have learned something, and this is something personal. Um, the only way, a couple of things, the only way to avoid conflict is to avoid people. And, and that's not a life. That's, there's no relationship there. Um, and to avoid conflict is to maybe learn from, from him that arrested conflict, from our Lord Jesus Christ, and from, from allowing the spirit to work within us, to allow his word to influence us, to allow love that he's shown to me, for me to show that love to you. Forgive one another as he forgave us. It's a commandment. And as I said, it doesn't matter where you worship. The challenges are exactly the same. And, um, and, and I said before about Paul putting a limitation on, on, um, on his responsibilities. But it depends on him. He wasn't expected from us as it as is possible to you. See, there's one thing I can't do is to control you, but I can control myself. So what I've learned in life, uh, wrongly or rightly, I, I'll just say, is that I have learned not to have any expectations from anybody. But I have high expectations of myself. Because the minute you have a lot of expectations from other people, you might well be disappointed. And I, I know that we do get disappointed because of our expectation. And it's not an easy thing to do, and I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but sometimes it's a coping mechanism in order to get through. But the responsibility still lies within me. I can only control myself. Um, so the expectations that I, when I read this, is not to have this expectation. See, Paul says, it's talking to me. It's talking to you, but I can only take it for myself. So in closing, do not neglect the gathering of the saints. So therefore the challenge is set before us. As I said, how things are going to be as we move beyond post-pandemic, I don't know. Um, the challenges are before us. Somehow I think the challenges might be a bit more challenging now than what they were before. But uh, with God's grace and with our commitment to him, we'll get through that. Amen. Now we'll allow uh, five, ten minutes if anybody has to share anything. It's always encouraging. I know that I get encouraged when I, when I hear somebody sharing something from their lives. Um, so, but all that uh, is said and done may be for his glory. Amen. <laughs>